Saint Bruno. Bruno was born at Cologne, about A.D. 1030, of an illustrious family. He was endowed with rare natural gifts which he cultivated with care at Paris. He became canon of Cologne and then of Reims, where he had the direction of theological studies. On the death of the bishop the sea fell for a time into evil hands, and Bruno retired with a few friends into the country. There he resolved to forsake the world and live a life of retirement and penance. With six companions he applied to Hugh, bishop of Grenoble, who led them into a wild solitude called the Chartreuse. There they lived in poverty, self-denial, and silence, each apart in his own cell, meeting only for the worship of God and employing themselves in copying books. From the name of the spot the order of St. Bruno was called the Carthusian. Six years later Urban II called Bruno to Rome that he might avail himself of his guidance. Bruno tried to live there as he had lived in the desert, but the echoes of the great city disturbed his solitude, and after refusing high dignities he wrung from the Pope permission to resume his monastic life in Calabria. There he lived in humility and mortification and great peace till his blessed death in 1101. Reflection O everlasting kingdom, said St. Augustine, kingdom of endless ages, whereon rest the untroubled light and peace of God which passeth all understanding, where the souls of the saints are in rest and everlasting joy is on their heads, and sorrow and sighing have fled away. When shall I come? and appear before God. October 7th, St. Mark, Pope St. Mark was by birth a Roman, and served God with such fervor among the clergy of that church, that advancing continually in sincere humility, and the knowledge and sense of his own weakness and imperfections, he strove every day to surpass himself in the fervor of his charity and zeal, and in the exercise of all virtues. The persecution ceased in the West in the beginning of the year 305, but was revived a short time after by Maxentius. St. Mark abated nothing of his watchfulness, but endeavored rather to redouble his zeal during the peace of the Church, knowing that if men sometimes cease openly to persecute the faithful, the devil never allows them any truce and his snares are generally most to be feared in the time of the calm. St. Mark succeeded St. Sylvester in the apostolic chair on the 18th of January, 336. He held that dignity only eight months and twenty days, dying on the 7th of October following. He was buried in the cemetery on the Adriantine Way, which has since borne his name. Reflection a Christian ought to be afraid of no enemy more than himself, whom he carries always about with him, and from whom he is not able to flee. He should therefore never cease to cry out to God, Unless thou, O Lord, art my light and support, I watch in vain. October 8th, St. Brigid of Sweden Brigid was born of the Swedish royal family, A.D. 1304. In obedience to her father, she was married to Prince Ulfo of Sweden and became the mother of eight children, one of whom, Catherine, is honored as a saint. After some years, she and her husband separated by mutual consent. He entered the Cistercian Order, and Bridget founded the Order of St. Savior in the Abbey of Wastein in Sweden. In 1344, she became a widow and thenceforth received a series of the most sublime revelations, all of which she scrupulously submitted to the judgment of her confessor. By the command of our Lord, Bridget went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and amidst the very scenes of the Passion was further instructed in the sacred mysteries. She died A.D. 1373. Reflection is confession a matter of much time or expense? asked St. John Chrysostom. Is it a difficult and painful remedy? Without cost or hurt, the medicine is ever ready to restore you to perfect health. October 9th, St. Dionysius and his companions, 
Martyrs, St. Louis, Bertrand. Of all the Roman missionaries sent into Gaul, St. Dionysius carried the faith the furthest into the country, fixing his see at Paris, and by him and his disciples the sees of Chartres, Centlis, Meaux, and Cologne were erected in the fourth century. During the persecution of Valerian he was arrested and thrown into prison, and after remaining there for some time was beheaded, together with St. Rusticus, a priest, and Eleutherius, a deacon. St. Louis Bertrand was born at Valencia, in Spain, A.D. 1526, of the same family as St. Vincent Ferrar. In 1545, after severe trials, he was professed in the Dominican order, and at the age of twenty-five was made master of novices, and trained up many great servants of God. When the plague broke out in Valencia, he devoted himself to the sick and dying, and with his own hands buried the dead. In 1562 he obtained leave to embark for the American mission, and there converted vast multitudes in the faith. He was favored with the gift of miracles, and while preaching in his native Spanish, was understood in various languages. After seven years he returned to Spain to plead the cause of the oppressed Indians, but he was not permitted to return and labor among them. He spent his remaining days toiling in his own country, till at length in 1580 he was carried from the pulpit in the cathedral at Valencia to the bed from whence he never rose. He died on the day he had foretold, October 9, 1581. Reflection The saints fasted, toiled, and wept, not only for love of God, but for fear of damnation. How shall we, with our self-indulgent lives and unexamined consciences, face the judgment seat of Christ. October 10th St. Francis Borgia Francis Borgia, Duke of Candia and Captain General of Catalonia, was one of the handsomest, richest, and most honored nobles in Spain, when in 1539 there was laid upon him the sad duty of escorting the remains of his sovereign, Queen Isabella, to the royal burying place at Granada. The coffin had to be opened for him that he might verify the body before it was placed in the tomb, and so foul a sight met his eyes that he vowed never again to serve a sovereign who could suffer so base a change. It was some years before he could follow the call of his Lord. At length he entered the Society of Jesus to cut himself off from any chance of dignity or preferment, but his order chose him to be its head. The Turks were threatening Christendom, and St. Pius V sent his nephew to gather Christian princes into the League for its defense. The Holy Pope chose Francis to accompany him, and worn out though he was, the saint obeyed at once. The fatigues of the embassy exhausted what little life was left. St. Francis died on his return to Rome, October 10, 1572. Reflection St. Francis Borgia learned the worthlessness of earthly greatness at the funeral of Queen Isabella. Do the deaths of friends teach us aught about ourselves? October 11th, St. Tarakas and his companions. In the year 304, Tarakas, Probus, Andronicus, differing in age and nationality, but united in the bonds of faith, being denounced as Christians to Numerian, governor of Cilicia, were arrested and conducted to Tharsis. They underwent a first examination in that town, after which their limbs were torn with iron hooks, and they were taken back to prison covered with wounds. Being afterwards led to Mopsustia, they were submitted to a second examination, ending in a manner equally cruel as the first. They underwent a third examination at Anna's Arbus, followed by greater torment still. The governor, unable to shake their constancy, had them kept imprisoned that he might torture them further at the approaching games. They were borne to the amphitheater, but the most ferocious animals on being let loose on them came crouching to their feet and licked their wounds. The judge, reproaching the jailers, 
with connivance, ordered the martyrs to be dispatched by the gladiators. Reflection Such is true Christian devotion. Neither death nor life shall be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. October 12th, St. Wilfrid, Bishop A quick walker, expert at all good works with never a sour face, such was the great St. Wilfrid, whose glory it was to secure the happy links which bound England to Rome. He was born about the year 634, and was trained by the Celtic monks at Lindisfarne in the peculiar rites and usages of the British Church. Yet even as a boy, Wilfred longed for perfect conformity in discipline, as in doctrine, with the Holy See, and at the first chance set off for himself for Rome. On his return he founded at Ripon a strictly Roman monastery under the rule of St. Benedict. In the year 664 he was elected bishop of Lindisfarne, and five years later was transferred to the See of York. He had to combat the passions of wicked kings, the cowardice of worldly prelates, the errors of holy men. He was twice exiled and once imprisoned, yet the battle which he fought was won. He swept away the abuses of many years and a two-national system, and substituted instead a vigorous Catholic discipline modeled and dependent on Rome. He died October 12, 709, and at his death was heard the sweet melody of the angels conducting his soul to Christ. Reflection To look towards Rome is an instinct planted in us for the preservation of the faith. Trust in the vicar of Christ necessarily results from the reign of his love in our hearts. October 13th, St. Edward the Confessor Edward was unexpectedly raised to the throne of England at the age of forty years, twenty-seven of which he had passed in exile. On the throne, the virtues of his earlier years, simplicity, gentleness, lowliness, but above all his angelic purity, shone with new brightness. By a rare inspiration of God, though he married to content his nobles and people, he preserved perfect chastity in the wedded state. So little did he set his heart on riches, that thrice when he saw a servant robbing his treasury, he let him escape, saying the poor fellow needed the gold more than he. He loved to stand at his palace gate, speaking kindly to the poor beggars and lepers who crowded about him, and many of whom he healed of their diseases. The long wars had brought the kingdom to a sad state, but Edward's zeal and sanctity soon wrought a great change. His reign of twenty-four years was one of almost unbroken peace. The country grew prosperous, the ruined churches rose under his hand, the weak lived secure, and for ages afterwards men spoke with affection of the laws of good King St. Edward. The Holy King had a great devotion to building and enriching churches. Westminster Abbey was his latest and noblest work. He died January 5th, 1066. Reflection David longed to build a temple for God's service. Solomon reckoned it his glory to accomplish the work. But we, who have God made flesh dwelling in our tabernacles, ought to think no time, no zeal, no treasures too much to devote to the splendor and beauty of a Christian church. October 14th, St. Callistus, Pope and martyr. Early in the third century, Callistus, then a deacon, was entrusted by Pope St. Zephyrinus with the rule of the clergy, and set by him over the cemeteries of the Christians at Rome. And at the death of Zephyrinus, Callistus, according to the Roman usage, succeeded to the apostolic see. A decree is ascribed to him appointing the four fasts of the ember seasons, but his name is best known in connection with the old cemetery on the Appian Way, which was enlarged and adorned by him, and is called to this day the Catacomb of St. Callistus. During the persecution under the Emperor Severus, St. Callistus was driven to take shelter in the poor and populous quarters of the city. Yet, in spite of these troubles and of the care of the church, 
he made diligent search for the body of Calipodius, one of his clergy, who had suffered martyrdom shortly before by being cast into the Tiber. When he had found it, he was full of joy and buried it with hymns of praise. Callistus was martyred October 14, 223. Reflection In the body of a Christian we see that which has been the temple of the Holy Ghost, which even now is precious in the eyes of God, who will watch over it and one day raise it up in glory to shine forever in His kingdom. Let our actions bear witness to our belief in these truths. October 15th, St. Teresa When a child of seven years, Teresa ran away from her home at Avila in Spain in the hope of being martyred by the Moors. Being brought back and asked the reason of her flight, she replied, I want to see God, and I must die before I can see Him. She then began with her brother to build a hermitage in the garden, and was often heard repeating, Forever, forever. Some years later she became a Carmelite nun. Frivolous conversations checked her progress towards perfection, but at last, in her thirty-first year, she gave herself wholly to God. A vision showed her the very place in hell to which her own light faults would have led her, and she lived ever after in the deepest distrust of self. She was called to reform her order, favored with distinct commands from our Lord, and her heart was pierced with divine love, but she dreaded nothing so much as delusion, and to the last acted only under obedience to her confessors, which both made her strong and kept her safe. She died on October 4th, 1582. Reflection After all I die a child of the church. These were the saint's last words. They teach us the lesson of her life, to trust in humble, childlike obedience to our spiritual guides as the surest means of salvation. October 16th, St. Gaul, Abbot St. Gaul was born in Ireland soon after the middle of the 6th century of pious, noble, and rich parents. When St. Columban left Ireland, St. Gaul accompanied him to England and afterward into France, where they arrived in 585. St. Columban founded the monastery of Anna Gray in a wild forest in the diocese of Bassencone, and two years afterward another in Luxeuil. Being driven thence by King Theodoric, the saints both withdrew into the territories of Theodibert. St. Columban, however, retired into Italy, but St. Gaul was prevented from bearing him company by a grievous fit of illness. St. Gaul was a priest before he left Ireland, and having learned the language of the country where he settled, near the Lake of Constance, he converted to the faith a great number of idolaters. The cells which this saint built there for those who desired to serve God with him, he gave to the monastery, which bears his name. A synod of bishops, with the clergy and people, earnestly desired to place the saint in the Episcopal See of Constance, but his modesty refused the dignity. He died in the year 646. Reflection If anyone would be my disciple, says our Savior, let him deny himself. The denial of self is, then, the royal road to perfection. October 17th St. Hedwig and St. Margaret Mary Alacoque St. Hedwig, the wife of Henry, Duke of Silesia, and the mother of his six children, led a humble, austere, and most holy life amidst all the pomp of royal state. Devotion to the Blessed Sacrament was the keynote of her life. Her valued privilege was to supply the bread and wine for the sacred mysteries, and she would attend each morning as many masses as were celebrated. After the death of her husband she retired to the Cistercian convent of Trebnitz, where she lived under obedience to her daughter Gertrude, who was abbess of the monastery, growing day by day in holiness till God called her to himself, A.D. 1242. Margaret Mary was born at Tyrol in Burgundy on the 22nd July 1647. 
During her infancy, she showed a wonderfully sensitive horror of the very idea of sin. In 1671, she entered the order of the visitation and was professed the following year. After purifying her by many trials, Jesus appeared to her in numerous visions, displaying to her his sacred heart, sometimes burning as a furnace, sometimes torn and bleeding on account of the coldness and sins of men. In 1675, the great revelation was made to her that she, in union with Father de la Colombière of the Society of Jesus, was to be the chief instrument for instituting the Feast of the Sacred Heart and for spreading that devotion throughout the world. She died on the 17th October, 1690. Reflection Love for the Sacred Heart especially honors the Incarnation and makes the soul grow rapidly in humility, generosity, patience, and union with its Beloved. October 18th, St. Luke St. Luke, a physician at Antioch and a painter, became a convert of St. Paul, and afterwards his fellow laborer. He is best known to us as the historian of the New Testament. Though not an eyewitness of our Lord's life, the evangelist diligently gathered information from the lips of the apostles and wrote, as he tells us, all things in order. The Acts of the Apostles were written by this evangelist as a sequel to his gospel bringing the history of the Church down to the first imprisonment of St. Paul at Rome. The humble historian never names himself, but by his occasional use of we, for they, we are able to detect his presence in the scenes which he describes. We thus find that he sailed with St. Paul and Silas from Troas to Macedonia, staying behind apparently for seven years at Philippi, and lastly sharing the shipwreck and perils of the memorable voyage to Rome. Here his own narrative ends, but from St. Paul's epistles we learn that St. Luke was his faithful companion to the end. He died a martyr's death some time afterwards in Achaia. Reflection Christ has given all he had for thee. Do thou give all thou hast for him. October 19th, St. Peter of Alcantara Peter, while still a youth, left his home at Alcantara in Spain and entered a convent of disalced Franciscans. He rose quickly to high post in the order, but his thirst for penance was still unappeased, and in 1539, being then forty years old, he founded the first convent of the strict observance. The cells of the friars resembled graves rather than dwelling places. That of St. Peter himself was four feet and a half in length, so that he could never lie down. He ate but once in three days. His sackcloth habit and a cloak were his only garments, and he never covered his head or feet. In the bitter winter he would open the window and door of his cell, that by closing them again he might experience some sensation of warmth. Amongst those whom he trained to perfection was St. Teresa. He read her soul, approved of her spirit of prayer, and strengthened her to carry out her reforms. St. Peter died with great joy, kneeling in prayer, October 18, 1562, at the age of 63. Reflection If men do not go about barefoot now, nor undergo sharp penances, as St. Peter did, there are many ways of trampling on the world, and our Lord teaches them when He finds the necessary courage. October 20th, St. John Cantius St. John was born in Kenty, in Poland, A.D. 1403, studied at Krakow with great ability, industry, and success, whilst his modesty and virtue drew all hearts to him. He was for a short time in charge of a parish, but he shrank from the burden of responsibility and returned to his life of professor at Krakow. There for many years he lived a life of unobtrusive virtue, self-denial, and charity. His love for the Holy See led him often in pilgrimage to Rome, on foot and alone, and his devotion to the Passion drew him once to Jerusalem, 
where he hoped to win a martyr's crown by preaching to the Turks. He died A.D. 1473 at the age of seventy. Reflection He who orders all his doings according to the will of God may often be spoken of by the world as simple and stupid, but in the end he wins the esteem and confidence of the world itself and the approval and peace of God. October 21st, St. Ursula, Virgin and Martyr A number of Christian families had entrusted the education of their children to the care of the pious Ursula, and some persons of the world had in like manner placed themselves under her direction. England being then harassed by the Saxons, Ursula deemed that she ought, after the example of many of her compatriots, to seek an asylum in Gaul. She met with an abiding place on the borders of the Rhine, not far from Cologne, where she hoped to find undisturbed repose. But a horde of Huns have invaded the country. She was exposed, together with all those who were under her guardianship, to the most shameful outrages. Without wavering, they preferred one and all to meet death rather than incur shame. Ursula herself gave the example, and was, together with her companions, cruelly massacred in the year 453. The name of St. Ursula has from remote ages been held in great honor throughout the Church. She has always been regarded as the patroness of young persons and the model of teachers. Reflection In the estimation of the wise man, the guarding of virtue is the most important part of the education of youth. October 22nd, St. Mello, Bishop, St. Hilarion, Abbot. St. Mello is said to have been a native of Great Britain. His zeal for the faith engaged him in the sacred ministry, and God having blessed his labors with wonderful success, he was consecrated first bishop of Rouen in Normandy, which see he is said to have held forty years. He died in peace about the beginning of the fourth century. St. Hilarion was born of heathen parents near Gaza and was converted while studying grammar in Alexandria. Shortly after he visited St. Anthony and still only in his fifteenth year he became a solitary in the Arabian desert. A multitude of monks attracted by his sanctity peopled the desert where he lived. In consequence of this he fled from one country to another, seeking to escape the praise of men but everywhere his miracles of mercy betrayed his presence. Even his last retreat at Cyprus was broken by a paralytic who was cured by St. Hilarion and then spread the fame of the saint. He died with the words, Go forth, my soul, why dost thou doubt? Nigh seventy years hast thou served God, and dost thou fear death? October 23rd, St. Theodoret Martyr. About the year 361, Julian, uncle to the emperor of that name, and like his nephew, an apostate, was made count of the East. He closed the Christian churches at Antioch, and when St. Theodoret assembled the Christians in private, he was summoned before the tribunal of the count and most inhumanly tortured. His arms and feet were fastened by ropes to pulleys and stretched until his body appeared nearly eight feet long, and the blood streamed from his sides. O most wretched man, he said to his judge, you know well that at the day of judgment the crucified God whom you blaspheme will send you and the tyrant whom you serve to hell. Julian trembled at this awful prophecy, but he had the saint dispatched quickly by the sword and in a little while the judge himself was arraigned before the judgment seat of God. Reflection Those who do not go down to hell in spirit are very likely to go there in reality. Take care to meditate upon the four last things and to live in holy fear. You will learn to love God better by thinking how He punishes those who do not love Him. October 24th, St. Maglior, Bishop, 
St. Maglior was born in Brittany towards the end of the fifth century. When he and his cousin, St. Samson, came of an age to choose their way of life, Samson retired into a monastery, and Maglior returned home, where he lived in the practice of virtue. Amon, Samson's father, having been cured by prayer of a dangerous disease, left the world and with his entire family consecrated himself to God. Maglior was so affected by this that with his father, mother, and two brothers, he resolved to fly the world and they gave all their goods to the poor and the church. Maglior and his father attached themselves to Samson and obtained his permission to take the monastic habit in the house over which he presided. When Samson was consecrated bishop, Maglior accompanied him in his apostolic labors to Armorica, or Brittany, and at his death he succeeded him in the Abbey of Dole and in the episcopal character. After three years he resigned his bishopric, being seventy years old, and retired into a desert on the continent, and some time after into the Isle of Jersey, where he founded and governed a monastery of sixty monks. He died about the year 575. Reflection Be mindful of them that have ruled over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end. October 25th Saints Crispin and Crispinian, Martyrs These two glorious martyrs came from Rome to preach the faith in Gaul toward the middle of the third century. Fixing their residence at Soissons, they instructed many in the faith of Christ which they preached publicly in the day, and at night they worked at making shoes, though they are said to have been nobly born and brothers. The infidels listened to their instructions and were astonished at the example of their lives, especially of their charity, disinterestedness, heavenly piety, and contempt of glory and all earthly things and the effect was the conversion of many to the Christian faith. The brothers had continued their employment several years when a complaint was lodged against them. The emperor, to gratify their accusers and give way to his savage cruelty, gave orders that they should be convened before Rictus Verus, the most implacable enemy of the Christians. The martyrs were patient and constant under the most cruel torments, and finished their course by the sword about the year 287. Reflection Of how many may it be said that they labor in vain, since God is not the end and purpose that inspires the labor? October 26th, St. Evaristus, Pope and Martyr St. Evaristus succeeded St. Anacletus in the Sea of Rome in the reign of Trajan, governed the church nine years and died in 112. The institution of cardinal priest is by some ascribed to him because he first divided Rome into several titles or parishes, assigning a priest to each. He also appointed seven deacons to attend the bishop. He conferred holy orders thrice in the month of December, when that ceremony was most usually performed, for holy orders were always conferred in seasons appointed for fasting and prayer. St. Evaristus was buried near St. Peter's tomb on the Vatican. Reflection The disciples of the apostles, by assiduous meditation on heavenly things, were so swallowed up in the life to come that they seemed no longer inhabitants of this world. If Christians esteem and set their hearts on earthly goods, and lose sight of eternity in the course of their actions, they are no longer animated by the spirit of the primitive saints, and are become children of this world, slaves to its vanities and to their own irregular passions. If we do not correct this disorder of our hearts, and conform our interior to the Spirit of Christ, we cannot be entitled to His promises. October 27. St. Frumentius, Bishop St. Frumentius was yet a child when his uncle, Meropius of Tyre, took him and his brother Odysseus on a voyage to Ethiopia. In the course of their voyage the vessel touched at a certain port, 
and the barbarians of that country put the crew and all the passengers to the sword, except the two children. They were carried to the king at Axuma, who, charmed with the wit and sprightliness of the two boys, took special care of their education, and not longer after made Odysseus his cupbearer, and Frumentius, who was the elder, his treasurer and secretary of state. On his deathbed he thanked them for their services, and in recompense gave them their liberty. After his death the queen begged them to remain at court, and assist her in the government of the state until the young king came of age. Odysseus went back to Tyre, but St. Athanasius ordered Frumentius bishop of the Ethiopians, and vested with this sacred character he gained great numbers to the faith, and continued to feed and defend his flock till it pleased the supreme pastor to recompense his fidelity and labors. Reflection The soul that journeys in the light and the truths of the faith is safe against all error. October 28th, St. Simon and Jude Simon was a simple Galilean, called by our Lord to be one of the pillars of his church. Zealots, the Zealot, was the surname which he bore among the disciples. Armed with this zeal, he went forth to the combat against unbelief and sin, and made conquest of many souls for his divine Lord. The Apostle Jude, whom the church commemorates on the same day, was a brother of St. James the Less. They were called Brethren of the Lord on account of their relationship to his Blessed Mother. St. Jude preached first in Mesopotamia, as St. Simon did in Egypt, and finally they both met in Persia, where they won their crown together. Reflection Zeal is an ardent love which makes a man fearless in defense of God's honor and earnest at all costs to make known the truth. If we would be children of the saints, we must be zealous for the faith. October 29th, St. Narcissus, Bishop St. Narcissus was consecrated Bishop of Jerusalem about the year 180. He was already an old man, and God attested his merits by many miracles which were long held in memory by the Christians of Jerusalem. One holy Saturday in the Church of the Faithful were in great trouble because no oil could be found for the lamps which were used in the Paschal Feast. St. Narcissus bade them draw water from a neighboring well, and praying over it, told them to put it in the lamps. It was changed into oil, and long after some of his oil was preserved at Jerusalem in memory of the miracle. But the great virtue of the saint made him enemies, and three wretched men charged him with an atrocious crime. They confirmed their testimony by horrible imprecations, first prayed that he might perish by fire, the second that he might be wasted by leprosy, the third that he might be struck blind if they charged their bishop falsely. The holy bishop had long desired a life of solitude, and he withdrew secretly into the desert, leaving the church in peace. But God spoke for his servant, and the bishop's accusers suffered the penalties they had invoked. Then, Narcissus returned to Jerusalem and resumed his office. He died in extreme old age, bishop to the last. Reflection God never fails those who trust in Him. He guides them through darkness and through trial secretly and surely to their end, and in the evening time there is light. October 30th St. Marcellus, the Centurion, Martyr the birthday of the Emperor Maximian Herculeus in the year 298 was celebrated with extraordinary feasting and solemnity. Marcellus, a Christian centurion or captain in the Legion of Trajan, then posted in Spain not to defile himself with taking part in these impious abominations, left his company, declaring aloud that he was a soldier of Jesus Christ, the Eternal King he was at once committed to prison. When the festival was over, Marcellus was brought before the judge, and having declared his faith was sent into a strong guard to Aurelian 
Agricolus, vicar to the prefect of the praetorium, who passed sentence of death upon him. St. Marcellus was forthwith led to execution and beheaded on the 30th of October. Cassian, the secretary or notary of the court, refused to write the sentence pronounced against the martyr because it was unjust. He was immediately hurried to prison and was beheaded about a month after, on the 3rd of December. Reflection We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of God, exclaimed one of the Maccabees. This sentiment should ever be that of a Christian in presence of temptation. October 31st, St. Quintin, Martyr St. Quintin was a Roman, descended from a senatorial family. Full of zeal for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, he left his country, and, attended by St. Lucian of Beauvais, made his way to Gaul. They preached the faith together in that country till they reached Amayen, in Picardy, where they parted. Lucian went to Beauvais, and having sown the seeds of divine faith in the hearts of many, received the crown of martyrdom in that city. St. Quintin stayed at Amayen, endeavoring by his prayers and labors to make that country a portion of our Lord's inheritance. He was seized, thrown into prison, and loaded with chains. Finding the holy preacher proof against promises and threats, the magistrate condemned him to the most barbarous torture. His body was then pierced with two iron wires from the neck to the thighs, and iron nails were thrust under his nails and in his flesh in many places, particularly into his skull. And lastly, his head was cut off. His death happened on the 31st of October, 287. Reflection Let us bear in mind that the ills of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory God has reserved for those who love him. November 1st, All Saints the Church pays, day by day, a special veneration to some one of the holy men and women who have helped to establish it by their blood, develop it by their labors, or edify it by their virtues. But in addition to those whom the Church honors by special designation, or has inscribed on her calendar, how many martyrs are there whose names are not recorded? How many humble virgins and holy penitents? How many just and holy anchorites or young children snatched away in their innocence? How many Christians who have died in grace, whose merits are known only to God, and who are themselves known only in heaven? Now should we forget those who remember us in their intercessions? Besides, are they not our brethren, our ancestors, friends, and fellow Christians, with whom we have lived in daily companionship, in other words, our own family? Yea, it is one family, and our place is marked out in this home of eternal light and eternal love. Reflection. Let us have a solicitude to render ourselves worthy of that chaste generation so beautiful amid the glory where it dwells. November 2nd. All Souls. The Church teaches us that the souls of the just who have left this world soiled with the stain of venial sin remain for a time in a place of expiation, where they suffer such punishment as may be due to their offenses. It is a matter of faith that these suffering souls are relieved by the intercession of the saints in heaven and by the prayers of the faithful upon earth. To pray for the dead is then both an act of charity and of piety. We read in Holy Scripture, It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. And when our Lord inspired St. Odilo, abbot of Cluny, toward the close of the tenth century, to establish in his order a general commemoration of all the faithful departed, it was soon adopted by the whole Western Church, and has been continued unceasingly to our day. Let us, then, ever bear in mind the dead and offer up our prayers for them. By showing this mercy to the suffering souls in purgatory, we shall be particularly entitled to be treated with mercy at our departure from this world, and to share more abundantly in the general suffrages of the Church, 
continually offered for all who have slept in Christ. Also on November 2nd, we commemorate St. Malachi, Bishop. During his childhood, Malachi would often separate himself from his companions to converse in prayer with God. At the age of 25, he was ordained priest. His devotion and zeal led to his being consecrated Bishop of Connor, and shortly afterwards he was made Archbishop of his native city, Armagh. This see, having by a long-standing abuse been held as an heirloom in one family, it required on the part of the saint no little tact and firmness to allay the dissensions caused by his election. One day, while St. Malachi was burying the dead, he was laughed at by his sister. When she died, he said many masses for her. Some time afterwards, in a vision, he saw her, dressed in mourning, standing in a churchyard, and saying that she had not tasted food for thirty days. Remembering that it was just thirty days since he last offered the adorable sacrifice for her, he began again to do so, and was rewarded by other visions, in the last of which he saw her within the church, clothed in white, near the altar, and surrounded by bright spirits. He twice made a pilgrimage to Rome to consult Christ's vicar, the first time returning as papal legate amid the joy of his people with the pall for Armagh, but the second time bound for a happier home. He was taken ill at Clairvaux. He died, age fifty-four, where he fain would have lived in St. Bernard's Monastery on the 2nd of November, 1148. Reflection our Lord said to St. Gertrude, God accepts every soul you set free, as if you had redeemed him from captivity, and will reward you in a fitting time for the benefit you have conferred. November 3rd, St. Hubert, Bishop St. Hubert's early life is so obscured by popular traditions that we have no authentic account of his actions. He is said to have been passionately addicted to hunting, and was entirely taken up in worldly pursuits. One thing is certain, that he is the patron saint of hunters. Moved by divine grace, he resolved to renounce the world. His extraordinary fervor and the great progress which he made in virtue and learning strongly recommended him to St. Lambert, Bishop of Maastricht, who ordained him priest, and entrusted him with the principal share in the administration of his diocese. That holy prelate, being barbarously murdered in 681, St. Hubert was unanimously chosen his successor. With incredible zeal he penetrated into the most remote and barbarous places of Ardennes, and abolished the worship of idols, and as he performed the office of the apostles, God bestowed on him a like gift of miracles. He died on the 30th of May in 727, reciting to his last breath the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. Reflection What the wise man has said of wisdom may be applied to grace, that he ordereth the means with gentleness, and attaineth its end with power. November 4th, St. Charles Borromeo About fifty years after the Protestant heresy had broken out, our Lord raised up a mere youth to renew the face of his church. In 1560, Charles Borromeo, then twenty-two years of age, was created cardinal, and by the side of his uncle, Pius IV, administered the affairs of the Holy See. His first care was the direction of the Council of Trent. He urged forward its sessions, guided its deliberations by continual correspondence from Rome, and by his firmness carried it to its conclusion. Then he entered upon a still more arduous work, the execution of its decrees. As Archbishop of Milan, he enforced their observance and thoroughly restored the discipline of his see. He founded schools for the poor, seminaries for the clerics, and by his community of oblates trained his priests to perfection. Inflexible in maintaining discipline, to his flock he was a most tender father. He would sit by the roadside to teach a poor man the potter and the ave, 
and would enter hovels the stench of which drove his attendants from the door. During the great plague he refused to leave Milan, and was ever by the sick and dying, and sold even his bed for their support. So he lived, and so he died, a faithful image of the Good Shepherd, up to his last hour, giving his life for his sheep. Reflection Daily resolutions to fulfill at all cost, every duty demanded by God, is the lesson taught by St. Charles, and a lesson we must learn if we would overcome our corrupt nature and reform our lives. November 5th, St. Bertil, Abbess St. Bertil was born of one of the most illustrious families in the territory of Soissons, in the reign of Dagobert I. As she grew up she learned perfectly to despise the world, and earnestly desired to renounce it. Not daring to tell this to her parents, she first consulted St. Owen, by whom she was encouraged in her resolution. The saint's parents were then made acquainted with her desire, which God inclined them not to oppose. They conducted her to a great monastery in Brie, four leagues from you, where she was received with great joy, and trained up in the strictest practice of monastic perfection. By her perfect submission to all her sisters, she seemed every one's servant, and acquitted herself with such great charity and edification that she was chosen prioress to assist the abbess in her administration. About the year 646, she was appointed first abbess of the abbey of Chael, which she governed for forty-six years with equal vigor and discretion until she closed her penitential life in 692. Reflection It is written that the saints raise themselves heavenward, going from virtue to virtue as by steps. November 6th, St. Leonard Leonard, one of the chief personages of the court of Clovis, and for whom this monarch had stood as sponsor in baptism, was so moved by the discourse and example of St. Remigius that he relinquished the world in order to lead a more perfect life. The bishop of Reims, having trained Leonard to virtue, he became the apostle of such of the Franks as still remain pagans, but fearing that he might be summoned to the court by his reputation for sanctity, he withdrew secretly to the monastery of Misi near Orleans, and afterwards to the solitude of Noblac near Limoges. His charity not allowing him to remain inactive while he was so much work to be done, he undertook the work of comforting prisoners, making them understand that the captivity of sin was more terrible than any mere bodily constraint. He won over a great many of these unfortunate persons, which gained for him many disciples, in whose behalf he founded a new monastery. St. Leonard died about the year 550. Reflection. The wicked shall be taken with his own iniquities, and shall be held by the cords of his own sin. November 7th. St. Willibrord. Willibrord was born in Northumberland, A.D. 657, and when twenty years old went to Ireland to study under St. Egbert. Twelve years later he felt drawn to convert the great pagan tribes who were hanging as a cloud over the north of Europe. He went to Rome for the blessing of the Pope, and with eleven companions reached Utrecht. The pagans would not accept the religion of their enemies, the Franks, and St. Willibrord could only labor in the track of Pepin Heristal, converting the tribes whom Pepin subjugated. At Pepin's urgent request, he again went to Rome, and was consecrated Archbishop of Utrecht. He was stately and comely in person, frank and joyous, wise in counsel, pleasant in speech, in every work of God strenuous and unwearied. Multitudes were converted, and the saint built churches and appointed priests all over the land. He wrought many miracles and had the gift of prophecy. He labored unceasingly as bishop for more than fifty years, beloved alike of God and of man, and died full of days and good works. Reflection True zeal has its root in the love of God. It can never be idle. It must labor, toil, be doing great things. 
It glows as fire, it is like fire, insatiable. See if this spirit be in you. November 8th, the Feast of the Holy Relics Protestantism pretends to regard the veneration which the Church pays to the relics of the saints as a sin, and contends that this pious practice is a remnant of paganism. The Council of Trent, on the contrary, has decided that the bodies of the martyrs and other saints who were living members of Jesus Christ and temples of the Holy Ghost are to be honored by the faithful. This decision was based upon the established usage of the earliest days in the Church and upon the teaching of the Fathers and of the Councils. The Council orders, however, that all abuse of this devotion is to be avoided carefully and forbids any relics to be exposed which have not been approved by the bishops, and these prelates are recommended to instruct the people faithfully in the teaching of the Church on this subject. While we regret, then, the errors of the impious and of heretics, let us profit by the advantages which we gain by hearkening to the voice of the Church. November 9th, St. Theodore Tyro, Martyr St. Theodore was born of a noble family in the East and enrolled while still a youth in the Imperial Army. Early in 306, the emperor put forth an edict requiring all Christians to offer sacrifice, and Theodore had just joined the legion and marched with them into Pontius when he had to choose between apostasy and death. He declared before his commander that he was ready to be cut in pieces and offer up every limb to his creator who had died for him. Wishing to conquer him by gentleness, the commander left him in peace for a while that he might think over his resolution. But Theodore used his freedom to set on fire the great temple of Isis, and made no secret of this act. Still his judge entreated him to renounce his faith and save his life. But Theodore made the sign of the cross and answered, As long as I have breath, I will confess the name of Christ. After cruel torture, the judge bade him think of the shame to which Christ had brought him, this shame, Theodore answered, I and all who invoke his name take with joy. He was condemned to be burnt. As the flame rose, a Christian saw his soul rise like a flash of light to heaven. Reflection We are enlisted in the same service as the holy martyrs, and we too must have courage and constancy if we would be perfect soldiers of Jesus Christ. Let us take our part with them in confessing the faith of Christ and despising the world, that we may have our part with them in Christ's kingdom. November 10th, St. Andrew Avellino After a holy youth, Lancelot Avellino was ordained priest at Naples. At the age of thirty-six, he entered the Theatine order and took the name of Andrew, to show his love for the cross. For fifty years he was afflicted with the most painful rupture, yet he would never use a carriage. Once, when he was carrying the viaticum and a storm had extinguished the lamps, a heavenly light encircled him, guided his steps, and sheltered him from the rain. But as a rule his sufferings were unrelieved by God or man. On the last day of his life St. Andrew rose to say Mass. He was in his eighty-ninth year, and so weak that he could scarcely reach the altar. He began the judica, and fell forward in a fit of apoplexy. Laid on a straw mattress, his whole frame was convulsed in agony, while the fiend in invisible form advanced to seize his soul. Then, as his brethren prayed and wept, the voice of Mary was heard, bidding the saint's guardian angels send the tempter back to hell. A calm and holy smile settled on the features of the dying saint, as with a grateful salutation to the image of Mary, he breathed forth his soul to God. His death happened on the 10th of November, 1608. Reflection St. Andrew, who suffered so terrible an agony, is a special patron against sudden death. Ask him to be with you in your last hour, and to bring Jesus and Mary to your aid. 
November 11th, St. Martin of Tours When a mere boy, Martin became a Christian catechumen against his parents' wish, and at fifteen was therefore seized by his father, a pagan soldier, and enrolled in the army. One winter's day, when stationed at Amiens, he met a beggar, almost naked and frozen with cold. Having no money, he cut his cloak in two and gave him the half. That night he saw our Lord clothed in the half-cloak, and heard him say to the angels, Martin, yet a catechumen, hath wrapped me in his garment. This decided him to be baptized, and shortly after he left the army. He succeeded in converting his mother, but being driven from his home by the Arians, he took shelter with St. Hilary, and founded near Potois the first monastery in France. In 372 he was made bishop of Tours. His flock, though Christian in name, was still pagan in heart. Unarmed and attended only by his monks, Martin destroyed the heathen temples and groves, and completed by his preaching and miracles the conversion of the people. Whence he is known as the Apostle of Gaul. His last eleven years were spent in humble toil to atone for his faults, while God made manifest by miracles the purity of his soul. Reflection It was for Christ crucified that St. Martin worked. Are you working for the same Lord? November 12th St. Martin, Pope St. Martin, who occupied the Roman See from A.D. 649 to 655, incurred the enmity of the Byzantine court by his energetic opposition to the monotheolite heresy, and the exarch Olympius went so far as to endeavor to procure the assassination of the Pope as he stood at the altar in the church of St. Mary Major. But the would-be murderer was miraculously struck blind, and his master refused to have any further hand in the matter. His successor had no such scruples. He seized Martin and conveyed him on board a vessel bound for Constantinople. After a three-month voyage, the island of Naxos was reached, where the Pope was kept in confinement for a year, and finally in 654 brought in chains to the imperial city. He was then banished to the Tauric Charency, where he lingered on for four months in sickness and starvation, till God released him by death on the 12th of November. 655. Reflection. There have been times in the history of Christianity when its truths have seemed on the verge of extinction, but there is one church whose testimony has never failed. It is the church of St. Peter, the apostolic and Roman see. Put your whole trust in her teaching. November 13th, St. Stanislaus Kostka. St. Stanislaus was of a noble Polish family. At the age of fourteen he went with his elder brother Paul to the Jesuits' college at Vienna, and though Stanislaus was ever bright and sweet-tempered, his austerities were felt as a reproach by Paul, who shamefully maltreated him. This ill-usage and his own penances brought on a dangerous illness, and being in a Lutheran house he was unable to send for a priest. He now remembered to have read of his patroness, St. Barbara, that she never permitted her clients to die without the Holy Viaticum. He devoutly appealed to her aid, and she appeared with two angels, who gave him the sacred host. He was cured of this illness by Our Lady herself, and was bidden by her to enter the Society of Jesus. To avoid his father's opposition, he was obliged to fly from Vienna, and having proved his constancy by cheerfully performing the most menial offices, he was admitted to the novitiate at Rome. There he lived for ten short months, marked by a rare piety, obedience, and devotion to his institute. He died as he had prayed to die on the Feast of the Assumption, 1568, at the age of seventeen. Reflection St. Stanislaus teaches us in every trial of life, and above all in the hour of death, to have recourse to our patron saint, and to trust without fear to his aid. November 14th 
St. Didicus. St. Didicus was born in Spain in the middle of the fifteenth century. He was remarkable from childhood for his love of solitude, and when a youth retired and led a hermit life, occupying himself with weaving mats like the fathers of the desert. Aiming at still higher perfection, he entered the order of St. Francis. His want of learning and his humility would not allow him to aspire to the priesthood, and he remained a lay brother till his death, perfect in his close observance of the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and mortifying his will and his senses in every way that he could contrive. At one time he was sent by his superiors to the Canary Islands, whither he went joyfully, hoping to win the crown of martyrdom. Such, however, was not God's will, and after making many conversions by his example and holy words, he was recalled to Spain. There, after a long and painful illness, he finished his days, embracing the cross which he had so dearly loved dur during his life. He died with the words of the hymn, Dulce Lignum, on his lips. Reflection If God be in your heart, he will be also on your lips. For Christ has said, From the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Also on November 14th we commemorate St. Lawrence O'Toole, Archbishop of Dublin. St. Lawrence, it appears, was born about the year 1125. When only ten years old, his father delivered him up as a hostage to Dermot McMurchant, King of Leinster, who treated the child with great inhumanity, until his father obliged the tyrant to put him in the hands of the Bishop of Glendolo in the county of Wicklow. The holy youth, by his fidelity and corresponding with the divine grace, grew to be a model of virtues. On the death of the bishop, who was also abbot of the monastery, St. Lawrence was chosen abbot in 1150, though but twenty-five years old, and governed his numerous community with wonderful virtue and prudence. In 1161 St. Lawrence was unanimously chosen to fill the new metropolitan see of Dublin. About the year 1171 he was obliged, for the affairs of his diocese, to go over to England to see the king, Henry II, who was then at Canterbury. The saint was received by the Benedictine monks of Christ Church with the greatest honor and respect. On the following day, as the holy archbishop was advancing to the altar to officiate, a maniac, who had heard much of his sanctity and who was led on by the idea of making so holy a man another St. Thomas, struck him a violent blow on the head. All present concluded that he was mortally wounded, but the saint, coming to himself, asked for some water, blessed it, and having his wound washed with it, the blood was immediately staunched, and the archbishop celebrated Mass. In 1175 Henry II of England became offended with Roderick, the monarch of Ireland, and St. Lawrence undertook another journey to England to negotiate a reconciliation between them. Henry was so moved by his piety, charity, and prudence that he granted him everything he asked, and left the whole negotiation to his discretion. Our saint ended his journey here below on the 14th of November, 1180, and was buried in the church of the abbey at Eu and the confines of Normandy. November 15th, St. Gertrude, Abbess. Gertrude was born in the year 1263 of a noble Saxon family, and placed at the age of five for education in the Benedictine Abbey of Rodelsdorf. Her strong mind was carefully cultivated, and she wrote Latin with unusual eloquence and, and force. Above all, she was perfect in humility and mortification in obedience and in all monastic observances. Her life was crowded with wonders. She has, in obedience, recorded some of her visions, in which she traces in words of indescribable beauty the intimate converse of her soul with Jesus and Mary. She was gentle to all, most gentle to sinners, filled with devotion to the saints of God, to the souls in purgatory, and above all to the passion of our Lord and to His sacred heart. 
she ruled her abbey with perfect wisdom and love for forty years. Her life was one of great and almost continual suffering, and her longing to be with Jesus was not granted till A.D. 1334, when she had reached her seventy-second year. Reflection No preparation for death can be better than to offer and resign ourselves anew to the divine will, humbly, lovingly, with unbounded confidence in the infinite mercy and goodness of God. November 16th, St. Edmund of Canterbury St. Edmund left his home at Abingdon, a boy of twelve years old, to study at Oxford, and there protected himself against many grievous temptations by a vow of chastity and by espousing himself to marry for life. He was soon called to active public life, and as treasurer of the Diocese of Salisbury showed such charity to the poor that the dean said he was rather the treasure than the treasurer of their church. In 1234 he was raised to the See of Canterbury, where he fearlessly defended the rights of church and state against the avarice and greed of Henry III. But finding himself unable to force that monarch to relinquish the livings which he kept vacant for the benefit of the royal coffers, Edmund retired into exile sooner than appear to connive at so foul a wrong. After two years spent in solitude and prayer he went to his reward, and the miracles wrought at his tomb were so numerous that he was canonized in 1246, within four years of his death. Reflection The saints were tempted even more than ourselves, but they stood where we fall, because they trusted to Mary and not to themselves. November 17th, St. Gregory Thaumaturgis St. Gregory was born in Pontus, of heathen parents. In Palestine, about the year 231, he studied philosophy under the great Oregon, who led him from the pursuit of human wisdom to Christ, who is the wisdom of God. Not long after, he was made bishop of Neo-Caesarea in his own country. As he lay awake one night, an old man entered his room and pointed to a lady of superhuman beauty and radiant with heavenly light. This old man was St. John the Evangelist, and the lady told him to give Gregory the instruction he desired. Thereupon he gave St. Gregory a creed which contained in it its fullness the doctrine of the Trinity. St. Gregory set it in writing, directed all his preaching by it, and handed it down to his successors. Strong in his faith, he subdued demons, he foretold the future. At his word a rock moved from its place, a river changed its course, a lake was dried up. He converted his diocese and strengthened those under persecution. He struck down a rising heresy, and when he was gone, his creed preserved his flock from the Arian pest. St. Gregory died in the year 270. Reflection Devotion to the Blessed Mother of God is the sure protection of faith in her divine Son. Every time that we invoke her, we renew our faith in the incarnate God. We reverse the sin and unbelief of our first parents. We take our part with her, who was blessed because she believed. November 18th, St. Odo of Cluny on Christmas Eve, A.D. 877, a noble of Aquitaine implored Our Lady to grant him a son. His prayer was heard. Odo was born, and his grateful father offered him to St. Martin. Odo grew in wisdom and in virtue, and his father longed to see him shine at court. But the attraction of grace was too strong. Odo's heart was sad, and his health failed until he forsook the world and sought refuge under the shadow of St. Martin at Tours. Later on he took the habit of St. Benedict, and was compelled to become abbot of the great abbey of Cluny, which was then building. He ruled it with the hand of a master, and the winningness of a saint. The Pope sent for him often to act as peacemaker between contending princes, and it was one of those missions of mercy that he was taken ill at Rome. At his urgent entreaty he was borne back to Tours, where he died at the feet of his own St. Martin, A.D. 942. 
reflection. It needs only, says Father Newman, for a Catholic to show devotion to any saint in order to receive special benefits from his intercession. November 19th, St. Elizabeth of Hungary Elizabeth was the daughter of a king of Hungary and niece of St. Hedwig. She was betrothed in infancy to Louis, landgrave of Thuringia, and brought up in his father's court. Not content with receiving daily numbers of poor in her palace and receiving all in distress, she built several hospitals where she served the sick, dressing the most repulsive sores with her own hands. Once, as she was carrying in the folds of her mantle some provisions for the poor, she met her husband returning from the chase. Astonished to see her bending under the weight of her burden, he opened the mantle, which she kept pressed against her, and found in it nothing but beautiful red and white roses, although it was not the season for flowers. Bidding her pursue her way, he took one of the marvelous roses and kept it all his life. On her husband's death she was cruelly driven from her palace and forced to wander through the streets with her little children, a prey to hunger and cold. But she welcomed all her sufferings and continued to be the mother of the poor, converting many by her holy life. She died in 1231 at the age of twenty-four. Reflection This young and delicate princess made herself the servant and the nurse of the poor, let her example teach us to disregard the opinions of the world and to overcome our natural repugnances in order to serve Christ in the persons of his poor. November 20th, St. Felix of Valois St. Felix was son of the Count of Valois. His mother throughout his youth did all she could to cultivate in him a spirit of charity. The unjust divorce between his parents matured a long-formed resolution of leaving the world and confiding his mother to her pious brother Thebald, Count of Champagne. He took the Cistercian habit at Clairvaux. His rare virtues drew on him such admiration that with St. Bernard's consent he fled to Italy, where he led an austere life with an aged hermit. At this time he was ordained priest, and his old counselor having died, he returned to France, and for many years lived as a solitary at Serfroyd. Here God inspired him with the desire of founding an order for the redemption of Christian captives, and moved St. John of Matha, then a youth, to conceive a similar wish. Together they drew up the rules of the order of the Holy Trinity. Many disciples gathered round them, and seeing that the time had come for further action, the two saints made a pilgrimage to Rome to obtain the confirmation of the order from Innocent III. Their prayer was granted, and the last fifteen years of Felix's long life were spent in organizing and developing his rapidly increasing foundations. He died A.D. 1213. Reflection Think how much, says St. John Chrysostom, and how often thy mouth has sinned, and thou wilt devote thyself entirely to the conversion of sinners. For by this one means thou wilt blot out all thy sins, in that thy mouth will become the mouth of God. November 21st, The Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Religious parents never fail by devout prayer to consecrate their children to the divine service and love, both before and after their birth. Some amongst the Jews, not content with this general consecration of their children, offer them to God in their infancy, by the hands of the priests in the temple, to be lodged in apartments belonging to the temple, and brought up in attending the priests and Levites in the sacred ministry. It is an ancient tradition that the Blessed Virgin Mary was thus solemnly offered to God in the temple in her infancy. This festival of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin the Church celebrates this day. The tender soul of Mary was then adorned with the most precious graces, an object of astonishment and praise to the angels, and of the highest complacence to the adorable Trinity, the Father looking upon her as his beloved daughter, the Son as one chosen and prepared to become his mother, and the Holy Ghost as his darling spouse. 
Mary was the first who set up the standard of virginity, and by consecrating it by a perpetual vow to our Lord, she opened the way to all virgins who have since followed her example. Reflection Mary's first presentation to God was an offering most acceptable in His sight. Let our consecration of ourselves to God be made under her patronage and assisted by her powerful intercession and the union of her merits. November 22nd, St. Cecilia, Virgin and Martyr In the evening of her wedding day, with the music of the marriage hymn ringing in her ears, Cecilia, a rich, beautiful, and noble Roman maiden, renewed the vow by which she had consecrated her virginity to God. Pure be my heart, and undefiled my flesh, for I have a spouse you know not of, an angel of my Lord. The heart of her young husband, Valerian, was moved by her words. He received baptism, and within a few days he and his brother, Tiburtius, who had been brought by him to a knowledge of the faith, sealed their confession with their blood. Cecilia only remained. Do you not know, was her answer to the threats of the prefect, that I am a bride of my Lord Jesus Christ? The death appointed for her was suffocation and she remained a day and a night in a hot-air bath, heated seven times its wont. But the flames had no power over her body, neither was a hair of her head singed. The lictor sent to dispatch her struck with trembling hand the three blows which the law allowed, and left her still alive. For two days and nights Cecilia lay with her head half-severed on the pavement of her bath, fully sensible and joyfully awaiting her crown. On the third, the agony was over, and A.D. 177, the virgin saint gave back her pure spirit to Christ. Reflection St. Cecilia teaches us to rejoice in every sacrifice as a pledge of our love of Christ, and to welcome sufferings and death as hastening our union with Him. November 23rd, St. Clement of Rome. St. Clement is said to have been a convert of noble birth, and to have been consecrated bishop by St. Peter himself. With the words of the apostles still ringing in his ears, he began to rule the church of God, and thus he was among the first, as he was among the most illustrious, in the long line of those who have held the place and power of Peter. He lived at the same time and in the same city with Domitian, the persecutor of the church, and besides external forces he had to contend with schism and rebellion from within. The Corinthian church was torn by intestine strife, and its members set the authority of their clergy at defiance. It was then that St. Clement interfered in the plenitude of his apostolic authority and sent his famous epistle to the Corinthians. He urged the duties of charity, and above all of submission to the clergy, he did not speak in vain. Peace and order were restored. St. Clement had done his work on earth, and shortly after sealed with his blood the faith which he had learned from Peter and taught to the nations. Reflection God rewards a simple spirit of submission to the clergy, for the honor done to them is done to him. Your virtue is unreal, your faith in danger, if you fail in this. November 24th, St. John of the Cross The father of St. John was discarded by his kindred for marrying a poor orphan, and the saint, thus born and nurtured in poverty, chose it also for his portion. Unable to learn a trade, he became the servant of the poor in the hospital of Medina, while still pursuing his sacred studies. In 1563, being then twenty-one, he humbly offered himself as a lay brother to the Carmelite friars, who, however knowing his talents, had him ordained priest. He would now have exchanged to the severe Carthusian order, had not St. Teresa, with the instinct of a saint, persuaded him to remain and help her in the reform of his own order. Thus he became the first prior of the barefooted Carmelites. His reform, though approved by the general, 
was rejected by the elder friars, who condemned the saint as a fugitive and apostate, and cast him into prison, whence he only escaped after nine months' suffering at the risk of his life. Twice again before his death he was shamefully persecuted by his brethren and publicly disgraced. But his complete abandonment by creatures only deepened his interior peace and devout longing for heaven. Reflection Live in the world, said St. John, as if God and your soul only were in it. So shall your heart be never made captive by any earthly thing. November 25th St. Catherine of Alexandria Catherine was a noble virgin of Alexandria. Before her baptism, it is said, she saw a vision. The Blessed Virgin asked her son to receive her among his servants, but the Divine Infant turned away. After baptism, Catherine saw the same vision, when Jesus Christ received her with great affection and espoused her before the court of heaven. When the impious tyrant Maximin II came to Alexandria, Fascinated by the wisdom, beauty, and wealth of the saint, he in vain urged his suit. At last, in his rage and disappointment, he ordered her to be stripped and scourged. She fled to the Arabian mountains, where the soldiers overtook her, and after many torments put her to death. Her body was laid in Mount Sinai, and a beautiful legend relates that Catherine, having prayed that no man might see or touch her body after death, angels bore it to the grave. Reflection The constancy displayed by the saints in their glorious martyrdom cannot be isolated from their previous lives, but is their natural sequence. If we wish to emulate their perseverance, let us first imitate their fidelity to grace. November 26th, St. Peter of Alexandria, Bishop and Martyr St. Peter governed the Church of Alexandria during the persecution of Diocletian. The sentence of excommunication that he was the first to pronounce against the schismatics, Melitish and Arius, and which, despite the united efforts of powerful partisans, he strenuously upheld, proves that he possessed as much sagacity as zeal and firmness. But his most constant care was employed in guarding his flock from the dangers arising out of persecution. He never ceased repeating to them that in order not to fear death, it was needful to begin by dying to self, renouncing our will, and detaching ourselves from all things. St. Peter gave an example of such detachment by undergoing martyrdom in the year 311. Reflection How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, says our Savior, because they are bound to earth by the strong ties of their riches.